Hey y'all, welcome back to the Hack Shack. Today we've got another box from the folks at Hacker Boxes. This is Hacker Box number 100, and the name is Centurion. Let's get this on the bench and see what we have inside here. Here we have some female female DuPont jumpers. Here we have a micro USB cable. This is our round 240 by 240 color display module. This is the Nano DLA 24 megahertz 8 channel logic analyzer. Looking forward to checking this out. Here we have some pin headers. Here we've got our Raspberry Pi Pico. That's what we'll be putting some code on this time around. Here we have six surface mount tactile button switches. And here we have the two surplus 16 gig USB flash modules. Here we have the MPU 9250 9 axis motion sensor module. And this is the Centurion Bus Analysis Target PCB. Pretty nice looking PCB. Here we've got a sheet of five elite hacker stickers. Pretty neat stickers there. And check this out this is the exclusive Hackerbox C Note PCB ruler. Very cool looking and a nice reference down the back for different things. Pretty cool. And last but certainly not least, we've got our Hackerbox 100 collectible reference card. Before we move on, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, PCB Way. Get ready to unleash your creativity. Join the PCB Way 10th Batch Design Contest now. Show off your skills and win exciting prizes. Visit PCBWay.com for more details. Don't miss out on this opportunity to shine. Enter the contest today. Submissions will be accepted through May 31st, 2024. Just like they always do, the folks from Hacker Boxes have included a great set of instructions here available on Instructables. I have a link to that in the description. And even if you didn't get this Hacker Box, I would say go check it out. It's got a lot of good tips and tricks for some of the hardware that's in here. So even if you don't have the Hacker Box, you might find it pretty handy. So this hacker box is all about using digital logic analyzers to be able to peek in and look at the things flying around with embedded microcontroller systems. And to do that, we're going to use this Nano DLA. So the first hello world kind of thing the instructable tells us to do is to plug this thing in with USB-C, which this does not include a USB-C cable. You'll have to do that on your own. But what we're looking for is that blue LED. And that's our first basic health check that the device may be okay. When the mini DLA is first connected, you'll see it's under here like this, like it doesn't have the proper driver installed. And this is exactly what we see in the instructable, and it tells us to get the correct driver. We need to get this Zadig application. So I followed the link in the instructable and downloaded the software. And next, when I ran the Zadig, or however you say it, application, I followed along with the instructable, the USB ID, match what they said and I use the FX2 LAFW. I hit the install driver button and it did its thing. And when it was finished, just like the instructable said, now the device showed up as expected with the proper driver. Following along with the instructable, the next thing it said to do was to install Pulse View. So I followed the link from the instructable, pretty standard Windows installation, just you know the next, next, next stuff. And that got that installed. So next, the instructable is having us turn our attention toward the Raspberry Pi Pico. And you may want to pause this if you've never pushed code to a Pico before. So do that right now real quick if you want to. Okay, so what basically this is telling you is that anytime you're messing with a Pico, to kind of get it into the mode to accept firmware or code, you have to power it on while you hold down the boot select button. And that's the button right here. I've got this arrow pointed to. And you can do that to put different firmwares on there or when you're using Arduino to kind of get it ready and get it into the mode to be ready to have the code sent to it, that's what you'll do. Next, the Instructable talks about setting up Arduino and setting up the Raspberry Pi Pico stuff following a link that it has. So I already have Arduino installed, so I followed that link and came across this right here. And this has the URL that you need to add into the preferences into the board manager in Arduino. And you can see here, I did that. Once I did that, I was able to go through these steps and add that support into my Arduino installation. With the Pico now supported within Arduino, the next thing that the Instructable wants us to do is use the example 
blink sketch that's built into Arduino and to send that to the Pico. So as you look here, you can see where I do that and we send it over. Then I'll switch to the top down camera on the workbench and you'll see that that was successful because we now have this LED blinking on the Raspberry Pi Pico itself. Now that we had our Pico support set up within Arduino, the instructable tells us to work on building our Centurion PCB. Now I must have double tapped the record button when I did that first side. Sorry about that, but I'll include everything else moving forward. Now, also, if you notice here, uh, I'm using the castellated pads. I'm not using pins. There are enough pins in here if you want to do pins instead of that, but I'm just going to work through these guys and go right on the castellated connections there. And you may see, I'll go back and show where I add a little more solder to some just to make sure I don't have any trouble, but I'm going to go through and do all these first. And then you'll also see me go through and add the breakout pins that correspond to these. After soldering in those headers, I gave it a once over, removed the blue tack, and gave it a quick clean. Next, the instructable says to download, compile, and upload the attached clockdivider.ino sketch. So I followed the link and got that sketch, opened it up in the Arduino software, and pushed that to the Pico. After that, I followed the next instructions that said connect the pins the Pico 2 through 5 to the channel 0, 1, 2, and 3 of the Nano DLA. It also advises to connect the ground between the two. Then it tells us to run Pulse View and click the device selector. In the pop-up we chose the FX2 LAFW, set the interface to USB, and we hit scan for devices, and then we see the Sigrock FX2 LA with eight channels. Then use the run stop to collect the signal data. I let that run for a minute and you can see all the stuff it's captured here. And just like the instructable tells us, we see a square wave clock signal on pin 2. We see a clock signal on pin 3 that has half the frequency of pin 2. And then one on pin 4 that has half the frequency of pin 3. One on 5 that has half the frequency of pin 4. I think this is a great first example that HackerBox has set us up with here to kind of show you the value this might give you when tinkering around with projects or trying to reverse engineer stuff. Next, the instructable is advising us to complete the assembly of our Centurion board. And we're gonna start out doing that with putting these surface mount switches on. And what you'll see here is after I pop all these out and get going, I'm gonna do the thing like maybe you've seen me do before. I'm gonna put a little drop of solder or two on one side of the switch and kind of hold it in place and then melt that solder, let the switch kind of fall down, then catch the other side and then potentially come back around to the original side and add a little more. So that's what I'll be doing here. Next, I uh, soldered header pins on the IMU breakout board as well as the display. Then as suggested in the instructable, I pried off the little bit of plastic here so that I could put the modules close to flush on the main PCB. Then I installed the display board onto the main board soldered it in and then afterwards since I have such an excess of pins you'll see where I clipped those off right here. Next I installed the IMU board soldered it into place and just like the previous time I used some clippers to get those extended leads out of the way and with that the Centurion PCB assembly was complete. Next the instructable advised that we needed to get a library for both the display as well as the IMU. Within the Arduino IDE, I searched for and installed both of these as directed. Next, the instructable said to grab this HB0100 underscore demo sketch, and we grabbed that, opened it up, compiled it, and pushed it to the board. With this code running on the Pico, it let us see that the display was working properly, and it also gave us a way to tell if all our buttons were working. You'll see I compressed the buttons here, and it tells us the A and B are the other ones, up, down, left, right. And you can see the X, Y, and Z are changing as the IMU is giving different output based on the motion. Next, I grabbed this Centurion ball sketch as directed, opened it up, compiled it, and sent it to the Pico. This resulted in a cool demo where you can lean the board around and it moves a ball on the screen 
and you can use the left and right button to change the color of the ball. Pretty cool. So our next instructable exercise is going to have us decode the I squared C traffic going on between the IMU and the Pico. So it has some pins here it references and tells us to use and I connect these up and you'll see here in just a second when we open up Pulse View. And I'm going to do the same things we've always done when we've opened Pulse View as far as selecting the correct device. Then I follow along with what the instructions say and I click on the decoder icon. I select I squared C that adds an I squared C trace. Click on the flag to the left of the trace and set the SDA and SCL pins to the ones I selected when I connected them up. Then I set the slave address as shifted and I hit the little start button here and you can see that we're seeing the decoded data which is pretty cool. Now I'm not going to go into this like as far as what exactly all this is but what you're seeing here is the actual on the wire data as the Pico is talking to the IMU module. So you can see how this would be very valuable when troubleshooting something or just trying to figure out how something works. Very cool. So the next exercise here in the Instructable has us sniffing the display data and that's SPI. And that's going to be you know, where the Pico is talking to that little color display. And I'm not going to bore you with all the pins and stuff, all that junk. I connected it up, fired up Pulse View, did a little bit different here with the SPI. You can check out the Instructable for the actual details here. But you'll see once I start sniffing, I'm actually seeing that data traffic for how the Pico is talking back and forth and changing things on the display. Pretty darn cool. I wanted to also share a real world example of my own where I used a logic analyzer to help troubleshoot some serial problems with a NABU retro computer. I'll throw a link in the description for one of those videos, but it's definitely something that is very handy if you're getting into electronics and tinkering around. I also wanted to say if you got this kit or if you get your own logic analyzer that's similar, um, I would look and make sure you get these hooks. Um, you don't necessarily always have to use them, but these hooks are very handy for like grabbing onto the leg of something that's in circuit or like a leg of an IC that you want to try to read from. They're very handy. So if you don't have any of those, I would suggest getting them. Sometimes when you buy one of these low cost analyzers, it, it will actually come with these type of leads. Now, one of the last things in the Instructable is this reference to Batacera. And that says maybe that's a good use for these uh, little surplus thumb drives that they threw in. And in the past, I had seen my neighbor here, Retro Combs, play around with that some. And I figured maybe I would give it a shot. So I put the image on one of these thumb drives and stuck it in a system I have here on the bench real quick and just kind of played around with it for a minute. I didn't get real in depth with it, but it's definitely pretty interesting and I may try to mess with it a little bit later. It's pretty cool. You might want to check it out. All right, folks, this is a little edit here at the last minute before sending this up. I'd originally planned on maybe giving away a portion of my completed kit as a little giveaway, but then I was having a little conversation with the folks over at HackerBox and they said, why don't we just do a giveaway and we'll actually send that winner or the one that's chosen rather an unassembled full kit of number 100 here. So that's what we're going to do. So basically today is March 24th and this is not an April Fool's joke, but on April 1st, I'll use one of those comment pickers to pick out a winner that we'll send this to. And all you have to do is just make a comment. If you have no interest in being selected as a person that would receive this, and we're only doing one, just put like no giveaway or something like that in your comment. But that's what we're gonna do, thanks to the folks at HackerBox. So get the comment in there and you may be able to win one of these boxes. And I think I forgot to say, but this is gonna be US only. Sorry folks. If you're not subscribed to Hacker Boxes and this looks like something interesting to you, they do have some in stock as of the time of recording here. So give them a look if that's something you'd be interested in. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye bye.